Mount Washington is more than just another mountain, and the road to the sky is much more than just the first man-made attraction in America. It's become a journey through time, a premier outdoor recreation center, and a destination for millions who have shared an American experience unlike any other. Today, the road continues to make history as it motors along in the 21st century. But it was in the 19th century that this story began, back when the auto road was still the carriage road. Come morning time, the horses are ready to go. Me and the other stage drivers generally don't have to wait long for a full load of passengers these days. It seems that more and more people want to go up Mount Washington, and it's our job to get them there. All right, move those trucks. With 125 horses and 20 mountain wagons working on this road, it creates quite a stir. But no matter, it's all a part of the show. Lowell Kelly Green. Mount Washington looms as a majestic beacon to travelers seeking an unchanged world above treeline. As the northeast highest peak, this behemoth of a mountain became a proving ground for those who would endeavor to conquer nature's elements. Its beauty masks the challenge that this rugged landscape holds, an irresistible challenge for those who open this mountain to the world. Since that time, Mount Washington's slopes have witnessed the development of the world's first mountain climbing locomotive, the birth of motorsports in America, and the highest winds ever recorded by man. All this history was waiting to be made when the road opened in 1861, but first they had to build it. A charter by the New Hampshire legislature was granted to David Maycumber in 1853, and there would be many pitfalls to overcome before the first passengers would ascend the eight-mile road to the summit. The Glen House, one of the first grand hotels in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, was opened by Colonel Joseph Thompson in 1852. He immediately began guided horseback tours up the mountain. Over the years, the Glen House grew and eventually boasted the largest parlor and longest veranda of any hotel in the world, stretching for more than 450 feet in length. As construction of the road continued, an article in Harper's Magazine recounted the observations of a young woman who visited the Glen House in 1854. We have all been walking in the lowering twilight on the road which is making its way up Mount Washington. Though nothing is impossible to modern science, it would seem impossible to vanquish the obstacles to the enterprise, the inevitable steepness of the ascent, the rocky precipices. We passed on through the debris of blasted rocks, stumps of uprooted trees, and heaps of stones, till we got far enough into the mountain to feel its stern solitude. With the night gathering its shroud of clouds about it, we were glad to pick our way back to the cheerful tea table at Mr. Thompson's. Mary Langdon. Several years of blasting, clearing, and climbing finally resulted in a passable route to the top, with an average grade of 12%. 
To ensure his place in history, Colonel Thompson drove his team up three weeks before the official opening with a photographer, of course. Finally, amidst much fanfare, the road's owners, local dignitaries, and the Irish immigrants who did the work gathered for a commemorative photo on August 8, 1861. The job was done. With the completion of the carriage road, passenger service to the summit began in earnest. What followed in the ensuing years was a golden era for the White Mountains. Railroads began to push their way into the area, bringing well-heeled Victorian travelers to spend the summer social season in the mountains. Each morning, the stage drivers hitch their six-horse teams to prepare for another ascent of the road to the sky. The smell of pine and horses mingled with the sounds of hoofbeats and the passing breeze. The horseman speaks to his team as the passengers utter exclamations of wonder for each new view that is revealed. Once at the halfway point, tourists and horses would regroup for the final push to the top. Though the halfway house is long gone, the point is still a landmark on the road. In 1869, the Cog Railway arrived on the scene, followed shortly thereafter by the construction of a summit hotel built to withstand the rigors of Mount Washington weather. Upon its completion, New England's high point offered lodging far removed from the realities of the world below. Each day's visitors even found their names printed in Among the Clouds, the only newspaper ever published on a mountaintop. Word continued to spread and soon an extensive fleet of mountain wagons utilized horsepower to its fullest. One famous writer of the time published this amusing account of his experiences. I send you a greeting this morning from the cupola of New Hampshire. If perchance you are suffering from the heat when this missive reaches you, let your eyes cool themselves by reading that just outside the tip-top house the mercury is at 34 degrees. The ride from the Glen was very easy. We rose indeed by climate as well as ridges. It was July at the base, late September on the ledge, and November at the apex. Reverend Thomas Starr King. When the original Glen House burned in 1884, an even more ornate version was built, riding the crest of popularity Mount Washington was enjoying. The resort life of the White Mountains was in full swing, though stage passenger counts were dwindling as the Cog Railway prospered. There were still plenty of tourists to go around, and the summit had lost none of its appeal, yet it seemed an age had passed when the second Glen House burned in 1893. Though few realized it at the time, a portent of good things to come occurred in 1899 when Freeland Stanley drove his Stanley steamer to the summit. The third Glen House was a far cry from those that preceded it, but the new century would herald a new age as summit stages began a transformation that would forever change the carriage road into the auto road. The first Glidden tour found these newfangled contraptions winding their way up the mountain. Newspaper accounts were not all favorable. The Manchester Union leader wrote, the whole thing is an unmitigated nuisance. The lives and property of perfectly helpless people have been menaced for no reason than to provide amusement for total strangers. Some drivers can be trusted, most cannot. If these people think of coming up another year, let them stay in jail a couple of days, and everyone will be the better for it. Editorials like this fell on deaf ears. What had started as a revolution became simply evolution. The die was cast, and transportation continued rolling ever onward toward mechanized horsepower.
In 1861, when the road first opened, it was a single lane gravel road, very rough experience. Now, in more modern times, the road is quite a bit wider, uh, quite a bit smoother, and about 80% of it's been paved. We've really used quite a diverse assortment of motor vehicles to guide our guests to the summit through the decades. The first automobile was a Thomas Flyer in 1912, which was followed by a fleet of Packards, and then Pierce Arrows, one of which we still have on display in our museum. Then we switched to Ford Woodies in 1938, then Internationals for a while in the 1960s, and finally on to the more familiar custom-built vans we use today. With the auto era began a renaissance for the road, as folks drove their own cars onto the crown of the presidential range and toured in comparative comfort in the road's old mechanized fleet. Now that the wooden wheeled mountain wagons were gone, a new generation of travelers were on the scene who only knew horsepower that was fed by gasoline. The automobile age ensured the road's future, and the tourist seasons began to overlap as skiing came to the North Country. Before the days of heavy equipment, it took a lot of manpower to open drifted parts of the road. As the tourist season approached, the road crew, armed only with shovels, would begin to move the mountain of snow that had accumulated in certain sections. Imagine facing this white wall, more than 20 feet high and 100 yards long, knowing it was your job to break through. Such was the life of the early road crews. We're up here about five and a half miles up the road on a section of the road called the Cragway. And it's well known in the summertime for its steepness in the area on the mountain. And more well known in the wintertime because of the way the snow drifts in here. If you look behind us here, you can see the slope of the mountain. Well, in the wintertime, this drifts right in with snow. We can have 25 to 30 feet of snow here by the end of the winter. We mark the edge of the road with these poles behind me. They're very important in the wintertime in particular, so that the snow cats that travel up to the summit still know where they are on the road. Now, they're not traveling on the road surface. They're way up above the road surface, 20 or 25 feet above the road surface, on an area that they've planed off with the blade on their snowcat. They travel to the summit on a weekly basis. Winter has now become a destination season here on Mount Washington with the advent of the snow coach offering tours to tree line on the auto road and with cross country skiing, snowshoeing and tubing at Great Glen Trails. What was always a summer business has now really become a year round operation. Who's next? Our day lodge provides a remarkable setting for activities on the mountain and around the trail system during both summer and winter. 
We have a year-round road crew whose responsibilities vary depending on the season and the time of the day. The weather plays an enormous factor in what the road crew is going to do hour to hour throughout the day. In the springtime, sometime in April, we make the decision that it's time to start the opening process. We take a look at the weather, long-range predictions, and try to figure out if the last of the big storms are by us. Then we go out the, uh, the process from the bottom, of course, work our way up. Uh, there's a big piece of equipment, bulldozer, that works its way backwards up the mountain, pushing any snow off, uh, off the mountain, and that's followed by a crew uh, with ice drills that take the ice out of the culverts that run underneath the road so that as it starts to rain, we can control that runoff. The bulldozer planes the road down to about a foot off the surface of the uh, pavement or the gravel, and then we uh, work the rest of it with an all-wheel drive uh, road grader as we go up. It's interesting historically how it's changed from the old days. In the old days, of course, it was all hand labor. In a way, we have a partnership with Mother Nature here on Mount Washington. We take care of the road and our guests, and every single day of the year, the Presidential Range provides the best show in town. You know, a lot of people think that Mount Washington can only be visited on a clear day because you're going for the view and that's all there is there. But that's far from the truth. Actually, the drama of Mount Washington comes out on a not so clear day. Between the weather and the alpine environment up on the top of the mountain, it's spectacular when there's clouds in the sky, when the wind is whipping across the top, when there's a little bit of rain or a little snow shower. It really can be phenomenal on a, on a, a less than clear day. Being prepared means having the ability to make decisions about safety and operation on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, as has always been the case on this mountain byway. Indeed, other than the form of conveyance, very little else on this road has changed since 1861. The anvil and tools of the horse trade have given way to different forms of technology, but basically, it's still people finding a way to climb a formidable mountain. While the cars and fashions might have changed with time, there is a certain continuity, even in the rituals of the base operation. When fire struck yet again in 1967, the fourth Glen House burned, which in itself was becoming a tragic tradition. Once again, the ashes were cleared, and it was business as usual for the Mount Washington Auto Road. Today's visitors still have the option of driving their own vehicles or taking a guided tour in the current stages, which bear little resemblance to their predecessors of more than a century before. Thanks to the establishment of the White Mountain National Forest, the Presidential Range will always remain a pristine vision of natural beauty. This is what the road has always offered. But that is the forecast according to the observatory, which is the weather station on the summit. For those who take the guided tour, the departure from the Glen affords an opportunity to sit back and be told a story or two by the modern day versions of the old horse drivers. Uh, there's probably been more written about this peak than any peak in world history. And uh, while we're traveling, I, I hope to share with you just some of the reasons behind that fame and why it is so studied and storied. Right here at the base, we begin at an elevation of 1,565 feet above sea level. We'll be climbing to 6,288 feet, the highest point east of the Mississippi and north of the Carolinas. The road we take up is the oldest active man-made attraction in all of the Americas. Up until about 1913, this was known as the Mount Washington Carriage Road. And in those days, you made this journey in a 12-passenger mountain wagon hauled by a team of six horses. A round trip in those days would take as long as six hours. And in the evening, the driver would spend his time completely rebuilding his brakes after every journey. The ascent up this pathway to the sky is one that can be made many different ways. The experience is never the same twice. The summit world today is comprised of the Sherman Adams State Park building and the lone surviving structures of the old days, the tip-top house and the old stage office where the world's highest winds, 231 miles per hour, were recorded in 1934. The road to the summit of New England's highest peak has compelled many individuals through the years to challenge themselves and the mountain. This has led to a continuing series of unique events. 
people have raced horse-drawn wagons, cars, bikes, and on foot. Some have been a bit more whimsical, like the man who counted his steps all the way up, 16,925, or the fellow who walked up backwards and blindfolded, while another walked up pushing a wheelbarrow with 100 pounds of sugar in it, without setting it down, of course. Serious competition began in 1904 with the first climb to the clouds race. As the first auto race in North America, it became a showcase for engineering excellence. A 60 horsepower Mercedes took top honors in 1904 with a time of 24 minutes and 37 seconds. These races continued through the years and the times got faster and faster as automotive technology improved. One constant factor has been the daredevil drivers who literally take their lives in their hands. Like Carol Shelby, who set a record in 1956 with a time of 10 minutes, 21 seconds. The climb to the clouds has always been a thrilling event. It represents an amazing contrast between modern technology and what was state of the art in 1904. The current record from bottom to top stands at well under seven minutes. Competition also began at the turn of the century and continues today. Each year, the Auto Road hosts what have now become world renowned bicycle races that draw top competitors. Grakeland Trails also hosts a series of bike racing and endurance events throughout the summer and fall. Come on, Matthew! Woo! The trail system offers varying degrees of challenge for either a family ride or a hardcore race amidst the most beautiful scenery in the northeastern United States. Okay, slow start. Pure manpower generates the energy for the foot races, which still take place annually on Mount Washington. As the top contenders now negotiate the eight mile course in just about an hour. Everyone comes to Mount Washington for their own reason. Some want to challenge themselves or the mountain. Some want to enjoy the view and the alpine environment. Remarkably, each generation travels the very same road and enjoys the very same experiences that the first visitors marveled at more than a century and a half ago. The appeal and the quality of this journey up a mountain and through time has never changed or diminished for those who find their way here. This mountain road truly does offer a glimpse of life as it once was. So much history has been written and so much of our world has changed. And still these mountains have borne silent witness as America has grown up around them. There is some comfort to be found in the timeless features of an immortal ridgeline. The mountain disregards our challenges and our records. It only bears witness. There were 31 states in the Union and Abraham Lincoln was president when this road opened to the public. Think of what's changed in the ensuing years. Today, few vestiges of our collective American heritage survive as reminders of a bygone era. But along this road remains an unbroken line to the past, which has been traversed by millions since 1861. Some intangible need to seek the awe-inspiring heights of this summit has always beckoned travelers. They made the journey by whatever means possible. The methods may have changed, but every generation, each in its own way, has taken a journey through time on the road to the sky.